How do you beat the tax man? Nobody likes to pay taxes, right? The IRS is coming down on you if you're in the United States. The Australian Taxation Organization is coming down on you if you're in Australia. I don't know what they're called in what it's called in Canada or the UK or Europe. Everybody hates paying taxes. And so today we're going to figure out a way to reduce your tax burden or avoid your tax burden maybe. Uh, and these are going to be um, little tax habits that you can implement um, mostly for the entrepreneur, mostly for business owners, but we're going to be talking about some stuff as well. If you are an employee and you have a job and how you can, you know, make maximize your tax strategy, uh, which is avoiding paying taxes as much as possible. Um, we're going to talk about some tax strategies if, uh, for real estate, if you're into real estate. Uh, and yeah, because guess what? Nobody wants to pay taxes. Donald Trump, President Donald Trump doesn't want to pay taxes. That's why he doesn't want to, he probably doesn't want to show his tax returns because, because he's not paying them. But we're going to find out today whether actually he's super, super smart with his tax strategies and not paying much, much tax or whether he is being like a conniving secretive president where he's trying to hide something dodgy. So, uh, to help us navigate the world of taxes, I've brought in uh, a new friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Ron Fossum, who I met in person, uh, just outside of Austin, Texas earlier this year when he and I were both speaking at an event, um, Ryan Moran's, uh, event about entrepreneurship. And I, uh, I interviewed Ron uh, on my, using my iPhone camera and he gave me this amazing tax strategy called the Augusta Rule, which we're going to talk about in this episode. And I went, went off to my accountant and I, and I said, the Augusta Rule, the Augusta Rule, can I use this? Can I use this? And my accountant has now confirmed that I can. And this is going to give me tax savings of about 40 grand, about four zero, forty thousand dollars $40,000 because of one piece of intel that Ron gave me. So uh, Ron... Uh, is an expert in this. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's passionate about taxes. If you, anyone could be passionate about taxes. <laughs> um, and uh, he's actually, he, one of his businesses was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize back in 2014. He's also a documentary maker. He's produced a documentary on the success coach, Jack Canfield, which is coming out soon. Um, but really, he's, he's, he really is a tax expert. Uh, and we're going to find out some ways on how you can beat the tax man. Ron Fossum, how are you, sir? Great to have you here. I am excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Well, I already have a man crush on you because you've helped save me a whole bunch of money. So <laughs> <laughs> um, let me start off by just asking a very, a very general question. And that is, why are so many people confused about taxes? There's, it, well, first of all, it's... Uh, the, the tax code in 19, it was in 1913, 1914, the whole code was like 400 pages. As of last year, it's 73,000 pages. So first of all, no one's read the whole thing. At a high school reading level, it would take us like 33 years to read the whole thing. And yet they, we want to go to, you know, one person and, get, and think that they've read the whole thing. So that, that's part of it. The other part of it is <clears throat> the tax code's really written by congressmen and is enforced by the IRS and inevitably in there, the lawyers get involved and try to add some definitions and some of the definitions just don't make any sense uh, to a lay person or an entrepreneur. And so it's very, very easy to get, to get confused around what is, why, why can one person take a deduction one way and why can someone else have to take it differently? Yeah. It gets crazy. It's overwhelming, right? I mean, I can, t I can tell you right up until, let's say two years ago when I started to really pay attention to tax, I w was avoiding it. I'm like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what the codes are. I have an accountant. And, and I remember sitting in my accountant's office many years and, and he or she would be, you know, telling me how much tax I own. They'd be in that be using these fancy terms about, um, um, you know, uh, ca capital gains tax and, uh, earned income and all these kind of like codes. And I would just glaze over. I'm like, I don't want to know this until I actually started to appreciate that it was super, super important that I understood at least some of this stuff. And now I take it super seriously. It's still overwhelming, but 
just little things like little things here and there is a difference between having to pay tens of thousands of dollars and not having to pay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. And there's, <clears throat> there's super simple things like just in the, in the definition of travel expenses, for example, I'll read it right out of the code. It says travel expenses defined for purpose. This is off IRS.gov. For tax purposes, travel expenses are the ordinary and necessary expenses of traveling away from home for your business, profession, or job. And then it, that's pretty simple. I get that. It says an ordinary expense is one that is common and accepted in your trade or business. Okay. The necessary expense is one that is helpful and appropriate for your business. When I think of necessary, I don't think of it as helpful and appropriate. The very next line is what confuses most taxpayers. It says an expense does not have to be required to be necessary. <laughs> well, I, I think of oxygen. Oxygen's required for me to stay alive. It's necessary for me to stay alive. Those are very similar words, but under the code, uh, one does not mean the other. And yeah. So where some of this confusion goes, uh, was what, when is it, when does this code apply to me and when does it not apply to me? Can I do this? Can I have a business meeting in the, in the Caribbean or on a cruise ship or something like that? And that's why so many different, uh, so much different advice is out there of yes, you can, no, you can't. And now accountants, a lot of the time don't know about the IRS code either, right? Like a lot of the times our general CPA who we trust to do our taxes at the end of the year, if we're hiring someone, a lot of times they don't even know what's going on. Oh, it's, it's crazy. So here's, here's kind of the evolution. Uh, Cause you run across entrepreneurs that have all kinds of different structures in place. So you can go, you got to do it yourself or at, you know, turbo tax at $99 a year or something. You go by the, it used to be the CD. I think it's a download now, but goes from TurboTax to bookkeeper and the bookkeeper at least kind of customizes it to you a little bit more. Then there's an accountant, there's a certified public accountant or CPA, then there's a tax preparer, tax planner, and then a tax attorney. And a tax attorney can be 500 to $5,000 an hour. And so clearly there's a full range of expertise in there. And most people try to get by with one of those. Rarely do they have two of them or a, a team to really understand what is applicable. And so it's very common. I, I mean, we need accountants. Uh, I, I love CPAs. They do a job, but they're really good at accounting for what has already happened or they're it's said another way, they're historians. They're, they're not really forward thinking. So James comes in next, next year and says, yeah, let's look at last year and now you know, forward project me into the future. Financial planners do this. We expect it, it's common, write me a plan, a financial plan for next year. But in the tax world, we want that from our accountants and, and it's just not the industry that they're built for. Mm. Yeah, there's a, I've learned very quickly, there's a difference between an accountant, bookkeeper, and then a tax advisor or a tax attorney. So an accountant will generally just do your books and look at what you've earned and what you need to pay and all that kind of stuff. But then you have someone who's more specialized, like a tax expert or a um, consultant who will actually look at it more in depth, is up to speed on the latest tax codes, and then is able to then look at your income and your tax liability and move things around or suggest yep. strategies, which again, like I said, is can be the difference between having to pay tens of thousands of dollars or, 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 or not. So very important that, that, that we, we know this. Um, and me personally, I have, uh, I've subsequently, since I've learned this, I've now engaged the services of people who, you know, look at what my accountant has compiled, but then gives me like a bigger kind of strategy, a strategic look at it and picks holes through it and, or, or finds little places where I can get um, breaks there. Um, yeah. and, and real quick, just so it's not overly complicated. We just told everyone the code 77,000 or 73,000 pages. There's really only four things. Everything that you could do is going to fall under four categories and it's usually either income shifting. So you're going to, change the structure of your entity or shift some income to lower brackets because it's, it's taxed differently. There's the timing of when you take a deduction, the actual code or a product or a service that you can add. So those four things, income shifting, timing, code, and product, those four things is how every tax strategy uh, can be used to reduce your taxes. Let me just go over those again. Income shifting. What were the other three? Yep. Timing. So yep. the timing of when you take a deduction can help. Mm -hmm. uh, code, 
Mm -hmm. It's already written in the code and it says exactly what it is. So the, the IRS is saying, hey, here's a tax tip for you. Mm -hmm. On, on IRS.gov, it actually says tax tip, big bold print. And then hmm. they give you a hint hmm. uh, of where it would apply. And then there's products and services that that help. Like okay. most people know that some forms of life insurance uh, can create some tax-free income while you're alive or tax-free death benefit, uh, that kind of stuff. Okay, great. So if you're listening to this and you're chomping at the bit and you really want to just get us, get us, uh, sorry, you really want Ron and I to get into some tax strategies for you, it's coming. Just hang on another minute or so and we'll get there. Um, and, and, and just so you know what's coming, we're going to be talking about some um, tax strategies for if you own a business, if you are a W-2 employee, uh, if you're self-employed, and also if you're international and you're wondering about if you have to pay American taxes as well, we're going to go over that. But just before we get into that, um, uh, is there a mistake that many Americans do uh, on a regular basis, Ron? Is there one simple mistake that... that that people are making, like the biggest mistake you see people make, so then we can avoid doing that? It, it could be something as simple as uh, how we're doing a, a simple investment. So if most Americans have a 401k through their employer, and then they're going out and buying a stock, well, you could buy the stock without the 401k, and you're going to be in a capital gains bracket, which is a 15 or 20% bracket. But because you've bought the same stock inside of a 401k, you get some tax deferral, but when you do end up taking that income, eventually you have to take the income. You've gone to an ordinary income tax bracket, which if you're halfway successful is going to be a higher bracket than the 15% or 20% you're going to be in the capital gains bracket. So that's income shifting. You've gone from a lower tax bracket to a higher tax bracket, hoping that the trade-off of deferral outpaces that. To complicate it even further, like if, if you and I go into the bank and we say, I want to borrow some money, None of us would borrow the money and sign on the dotted line if we didn't know the terms of the loan. If the bank said, pay me back at some point in the future, and whenever you decide to pay me back, that's when I'll decide how much interest I'm gonna charge you, none of us would ever do that loan. Like we would never do it. But we're doing that with our retirement plans all the time. We're deferring the tax into the future when more than likely, my belief is, my belief is taxes are gonna be higher. You ask every, every stage I've ever been on, I ask the audience, show of hands, how many people think taxes are going up? I get everybody. How many think taxes are going down? I get nobody. But yet, we're going through this tax deferral to when they're going to be higher idea. And, and it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense most of the time when you do the math. So that's a, that's a good example of where we really need to look at someone's specific situation and say, is it a good idea? Is it not a good idea? And, and just finally, before we get into these strategies, what is the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? That's a, that's a good question because so many people just surrender that I have to pay something and if I go do any type of tax strategies, I'm gonna get in trouble because some of those cases make a lot of news. Uh, like especially actors like uh, Crocodile Dundee got in trouble. Wesley Snipes got in trouble. Right? I love how you call him Crocodile Dundee. You're referring to the great Hollywood, uh, great Australian <laughs> acting icon and legend, Paul Hogan. Paul Hogan. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I like you just typical American, just like, ah, forget his name. <laughs> that Crocodile Dundee dude, you know, Paul Hogan. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, just to give context, Paul Hogan, who starred in the 1986 movie Crocodile Dundee and was very famous for the catchphrase, you know, G'day, mate, and like come throw another shrimp on the barbie. Uh, he was investigated very heavily by the Australian Taxation Office for a number of years, and he ended up um, beating the rap. He actually ended up uh, not having, they found that he didn't do anything wrong, but this thing drew out over like three or four years and it kind of stained his reputation. Um, so that's, what's, that, that's what Ron is referring to there. Yeah, and it, it isn't true that the bad news is what makes the press, the end of the story isn't nearly as well known, right? Exactly. It was like, you know, yeah, that's the way of the world though sometimes. <laughs> so the, uh, the tax evasion component is, is absolutely criminal. Uh, and and I'll, I'll read it right out of the code. It says, an attempt to reduce your tax liability by deceit, subterfuge, or concealment. Right? So you're trying to lie, cheat, and steal in order to not pay taxes, you're going to be in trouble. Tax avoidance is... Again, this is directly off the IRS.gov website. Tax avoidance is completely legal. 
lowering your tax bill by structuring your transaction to reap the largest tax benefit for you. Mm. And as, as you go through IRS.gov, they, they literally tell you that a, a good tax plan will evaluate different ways to take the same deduction. You could take one deduction one way. I could have to take it another way because we're in different industries. Mm. And I think that's what, what, what President Donald Trump's argument is, is that he's not evading tax. He's yes. legally and, and morally and ethically uh, avoiding it, right? He's not evading and trying to be deceitful. He seems to be arguing that he's, well, he's just playing within the rules. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, rule, they're rules. And it's, it's kind of interesting because this is the first time we've ever had a real estate-based president, right? Uh, but the, the good news, uh, if there's good news in in this at all is the I, there's a uh, there's a law that says the vice the vice president and the president get audited every year now that so long as they're in office mm. and that's that started back in the 70s mm. so if uh if he didn't have his fair share of audits before he certainly will was so long as he <laughs> <in office. laughs> all right let's get into the nitty-gritty here we've yeah. uh we've done enough build up here so let's um let's do what we'll do this is how we'll do it we'll do some simple strategies for w2 employees and then we'll move on to um the entrepreneurial to people who own businesses so let's start with 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 the employee if someone's listening here they're an employee they're a w2 here in the u.s what's some simple strategies they can incorporate ron well, there's uh, just to understand, first of all, and this kind of applies to everybody, but understand that the, the IRS doesn't make the rules. Uh, this was like a big aha moment for me in the beginning was congressmen really make the rules and then send it over to the IRS to enforce it. And so congressmen are writing rules. I mean, the Roth IRA was named after the congressman who wrote that rule. The Augusta deduction was kind of nicknamed after the senator from Georgia who submitted the rule that says, hey, here's a way that you can deduct some, some, some stuff. So they're writing rules to, to benefit themselves. And we just need to understand the intent behind the rule and when it's applicable. So for a, for a W-2 employee, most people just think it's, well, I got my mortgage and I got my kids. You know, my employer takes out the rest of the taxes and I can't really deduct anything else. But that's not really true. You, you can deduct all kinds of stuff or you can have other income that isn't necessarily taxable. So for example, uh, when you buy a house, uh, I, I love real estate. I think we bought nearly 400 homes during the crisis, single family homes. When you buy it on discount and then you go do a cash out refi because it's a loan. Uh, so if I buy a $100,000 house for 60 grand and then I go finance it for $80,000, I'm gonna pull out that extra cash and that's not income under the IRS rules. But yet I can spend the money however I wanna spend the money. And so cash out, of a uh, of, of a property, whether it's real estate or if it's a car or if it's your your life insurance, and that's structured properly, uh, there's all kinds of ways to get income without it being taxed as ordinary income, like you've earned it from your employer. So that that's that's one almost everyone can use. Uh, another no-brainer one is take your hobbies and make it a business. So whatever you thoroughly enjoy in your pastime, uh, if you enjoy it so much. The IRS's requirement is you only have to have an intent to make a profit. So write yourself a business plan of how you're going to make some money. Uh, shouldn't take more than 30 minutes or something like that. Start a little LLC on the side. But now that you're a business, you're entitled to take all kinds of deductions against all other income that you normally wouldn't have had. So let, let me give you an example of this. I love this idea. Like take your hobbies and make it a business. So let's just say you love going to the movies. You just love to watch movies and you go to the cinema three times a week and you're spending, well, in LA, it could be like $18 for a damn ticket. But let's say, <laughs> let's say it's $12, right? Wherever you are, $12 for a movie ticket. 12 times three is $36. Let's say you spend $36 every week on going to the movies. What Ron seems to be saying here is that why don't you – have the intent of being a movie reviewer, starting a YouTube channel where you review movies, where you walk out of the cinema, you record yourself on an iPhone saying this movie sucked or this movie was great. And you do it with the intent for business. So you'd start an LLC, which would be like John Smith LLC. And then um, you have the intent of being a movie reviewer. Now the $36 every week that you're spending on going to the movies, that's now a tax write off, right? Like that's now, now you don't. You can claim that with the tax man, correct? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a legitimate business expense because you're in that industry. Uh, another one was uh, kind of a high profiled, uh, one of my buddies was his tax advisor on that one, but he said, I want to deduct all my clothes and I can't deduct all my clothes, but he's a rapper, he's on stage. And it's, well, you know, actors have, have to have certain outfits, right? And if you're putting out a persona and it's marketed that way, you're in LA, you get this, then all he had to do was open a production company and have his production company uh, do all the clothes. But because he didn't have a production company, it wasn't, it wasn't real. You can't deduct just, you know, the clothes you and I are wearing, but it's required when you're an actor or you're in the producing of films or you go on stage for live performances. So now some of his clothes are, are deductible. Mm. When I go traveling overseas, um, I record a lot of my travels on my Snapchat and my Insta stories. Uh, for example, next month I'm going to the UK, Lithuania, Spain, and then I'm going to Tampa, Florida, Mexico, and then I'm going to Texas for a combination of just fun travel, but also some, some work type um, stuff. And I will be documenting it every step of the way on my Snapchat and on my Insta stories. And I consider that to be a business expense because I have a lifestyle business. I coach people on how to travel the world while having an online business. I'm talking about my Swanee's blue light blocking glasses. I'm recording episodes of this very podcast while I'm on the road. So therefore, Ron, I mean, I already know the answer, but let me ask you as the tax expert, my fl- the, the money that I spend on my flights and my accommodation on my food on getting to and from those places can I claim those as a business expense, Ron? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And- yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I don't have to spend it out of my personal income. I can spend it out of my business as a legitimate business expense, correct? Exactly. And there's, there's all kinds of rules around it, right? So uh, domestic travel, you can count both ways. International travel, sometimes you count one. Uh, you don't count the travel the, the day you leave the States but you do count the day that you come back into the States unless there's these four exceptions. So that it's, again, it's back to why it's always confusing. Uh, but absolutely it's it, travel is a, is a very legitimate, if it's required mandatory necessary uh, for your business and customary, which it clearly is um, it's absolutely deductible. Yeah. I love it. And so just one more analogy for the employee who's listening now. Um, let's just say you like to go, um, you like football, you like the NFL, you like the NBA, whatever, whatever your sport is. Maybe you have the intent of creating a business where you review each game after each game. And so now the, the, let's say a ticket to the basketball or the, or the, or the, or the, um, or the NFL is like a hundred dollars for a ticket to go and watch your team in person or it might be $200 these days. Um, if you have the intent of talking about the game afterwards, again, on a YouTube channel or on a blog or something like that, now you can claim the, the, the price of your, of your ticket. So when Ron's talking about hobbies, it's like, what do you like to do? If, as long as you've got a, a, the intent of building a business around it or you actually have a business around that thing, you can claim all of those fun exercises um, as a tax deduction. Yeah, and that'll help. Even if you end up losing some money, that'll help offset the taxes that you would normally have earned and, and paid inside your W-2 income. Right. Anything else for W-2 employees, Ron? Uh, try, to, try to, if you're going to do retirement, I would only do some, some Roth type stuff, whether it's a Roth IRA, Roth 401k, uh, tax-free, position your money so you're tax-free. Uh, generally speaking, uh, again, I, we probably should start with a disclaimer that all of this is applicable to somebody, but not everybody. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so, so uh, please understand all the advice that we're giving here that Ron's giving or sharing. We're not taking any responsibility for, for you doing it. You can't go and implement this and then come back and say, you told me to do this, blah, blah, blah. Like you've got to do your own research. You've got to talk to your own advisor. So Ron can give you his intel to the best of his knowledge, but ultimately you are responsible for whatever actions you take from here. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it clearly it's going to apply to somebody, but not everybody. So um Try, try to just structure your retirement so it's tax. You can retire so much sooner if you have a tax exempt, tax free, tax free retirement structure. So just uh, explain that a tax exempt retirement structure. Just explain that. Well, if, if someone's got a you know, saved, a, you know, millionaire seems to be this, you know, benchmark that that a lot of people try to shoot for. So if you're a millionaire, you've saved a million dollars in a traditional four hundred one k or traditional IRA. 
you, you really don't own a million dollars. Uh, you've partnered with the government and they're going to take 30 to 40% of that, depending on what state you're in and what your federal bracket is. Um, and so you really have like $600,000 by the time you're done versus you have the, you know, 700 or $800,000 in a Roth, which is tax free always or inside life insurance. Uh, you're not going to have to pay tax on those. And so the dollars become much more efficient. You don't need as many in order to get to your goal of retirement. And so just, just understand that frequently deferring the tax. Uh, I mean, think about it, really. When was the last time we had a problem that we ignored for decades and it just simply got better? Like I ignore my health for decades and it got better, right? Uh, I've got a, a relationship or an employee who's not doing what they need to be doing. I'm just going to ignore it and it magically goes away and gets better. And that just isn't our reality. So deferring tax and ignoring it till retirement, uh, frequently when you do the math on the distribution side, frequently it doesn't make sense. So, so just, Okay. Yeah. So your advice is do not defer tax until retirement and, and, and instead do what? Well, you use other accounts that, uh, that allow it to be tax-free forever. So it's uh, like a Roth IRA. You pay your tax up front, but you don't have to pay tax on any of the earnings ever. Gotcha. So okay. think about it like paying tax on the seed or paying tax after you've planted the seeds and it's grown to a big harvest and they're going to tax the whole harvest. Yeah. So you're saying pay the tax now and be done with it versus deferring the tax, which the taxes are going to go up. And then, you know, in retirement, you're going to get, get stung as you pull out yeah. that money. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying do the math. And frequently, I mean, the first time I, I used to sell traditional IRAs, 401ks and man, the first hundred times I did the math, I'm like, I'm trying to find a situation that it really fits. And there are some it does. Uh, but generally speaking, deferring it to when taxes are going to be higher. I think they're going up. Uh, and not small. I mean, come on, we just spent trillions of dollars in America trying to recover the economy. Uh, I can't imagine taxes going down in the, in the long term. Okay. So there you go. Take your hobbies and make it a business. If you, yeah. you don't even have to make a profit, you just have to have an intent to make a, a profit and then do the math. Do not, uh, Ron's advice here is do not defer your tax until retirement when taxes are likely going to be higher Instead, use other accounts that allows it to be tax-free forever, like a Roth IRA, right, Ron? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, take that one step further real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of ties into maybe the question you asked earlier was the mistake frequently everyone is making is there's this common belief, and if, you're, if your tax person is telling this or your retirement person is telling you this, it might be time to upgrade your, your advisor, is... Uh, I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket when I'm in retirement. It's, it's so common. I hear it all the time. And it's like, really? Cause to go from $150,000 lifestyle to go to the next bracket down, you got to get your, your spending down to 50. So who wants to cut two thirds out of their income out to be in this lower tax bracket and then live on a smaller number? I mean, if there's a dis disincentive to, to, to live in a life and setting up your retirement, I don't know what it is. That is huge. I don't want to learn how to live on 50 grand uh, when my lifestyle is 150. Wow. All right. So there were some good advices, some great advice there for the, uh, for the employee. So we move on now, Ron, to the self-employed. Now, is self-employed different from being an entrepreneur or a business owner? Or is it the same thing? Uh, it can be the same thing, and it's usually self-employed. You start up, and you kind of have your own job. Uh, but once you start hiring others, uh, you kind of you kind of tend to get more into the entrepreneur, mm. solo entrepreneurs. But by and large, uh, most businesses that scale big tend to take on some employees. So there's a fine line that may or may not make a difference there. Okay, so for the business owner or the entrepreneur or the self-employed. Let's go through a few cool little uh, tax saving strategies here, Ron. So this will kind of fall into the, the income shifting rule that we talked about. One of the ways is, is instead of taking income, which is taxed as ordinary income, uh, or even taking it as a self-employed person, which then you get a self-employment tax uh, put on it, 
then take out, and this is very, very common in executive level companies, the CEO, COO, CFO, uh, all those guys can take a shareholder loan at very favorable terms from the company and very favorable repayment terms. So I'm an executive at Microsoft and Microsoft has said that, you know, the C-suite level executives can borrow, you know, $100,000 with, you know, market rates, which are what, 3% or 4%. And they can kind of pay it back, you know, uh, on some kind of terms that are very favorable. Maybe there's required monthly payments, maybe there's not, but the corporation really gets to make up the rules. And so you can't use this one every year, and it's important everyone hears that one. Don't use this every year, but take some income out of your business uh, as a shareholder loan instead of income. And it kind of goes back to that example I said about, uh, you know, cash out refi. Mm -hmm. uh, technically, it's money you can use however you want to use it, but it's not income. So then, hence, it's not taxed. Mm. But you can't do it, you know, five years in a row. I'm taking out $2 million out of my business and it's a shareholder loan and the number just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The IRS is going to cry foul on that. Uh, for sure. So just take, take some money out as a shareholder loan, document it properly by having uh, what, what the bank would charge for a, a small business loan is an interest rate. And then maybe your terms are you pay it back, uh, you know, no payments for the first year. You start payments in the second year, you pay it back over five years. Or maybe your plan is to sell the business within the next couple of years. And so upon the sale of the business, it'll be returned. Uh, at that time and there is no payments until then. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different ways you can structure it, but take that loan from your business, you personally, and then that's not taxed. Uh, yeah. So that means that, so basically let's just say you, you, you have a business. Basically what you're doing is, is that uh, rather than paying yourself a salary or paying yourself from the business into your personal account, because we, we need personal money, you need to pay ourselves a salary, or, you know, to live, to pay the rent or buy the groceries or whatever. What you're saying is, is that, um, and by the way, sorry, when you pay yourself that income, it is taxed, right? Like government will take a hit. But what you're saying is that once, um, you know, once every five years, I guess, like not every, not every year, but once every five years, you can classify a payment to yourself as a loan, as a personal loan from your business, which is completely tax-free. Is that correct? Yeah. And then is, so long as, as you pay it back to the company at some, at some point. But again, it's just, it's tax-free income. So the money that goes from your business account to your personal account, you don't have to pay tax on personally. It's just like a transfer essentially. And then at some point later on, you pay it back either with interest or, or no interest, Ron? Well, it, it's got to be reasonable and customary. And if you borrowed money from anywhere else, there'd be some interest. So uh, mm. it has to be documented. It can't be a random, you know, $2 million that just came out for no reason. Uh, you got to have a loan doc between you personally and the company. There's got to mm -hmm. be terms associated. You got to have a balance, interest rate, payment, default language, all that needs to be in there. So just document it properly. Is, okay. uh, is all you really need to do. Okay, great. All yeah. right, what's another tip? Let's move on to the next one. Uh, this, is, this, will, this one should apply to what you're doing. Uh, normally, uh, what we pay for our, our clothes, having our shirts pressed or laundry is, is not tax deductible. But while you're in travel status, it is. So hmm. when you're traveling the world and you're paying, uh, you, you send your stuff down to the hotel uh, to get cleaned, because you're going to be on film the next day. Laundry is 100% tax deductible while you're in travel status, which is an overnight stay away from your primary tax home or where you primarily do business. Mm. So if you come out of LA, you fly up to San Francisco for the night. If you pack dirty, dirty laundry and have it cleaned in, in the new city, uh, it's 100% deductible. I love it. I'm a big fan. I'm pretty filthy. I'm a filthy animal. <laughs> I tend to go on trips and I don't do laundry much, much to the dismay of, uh, of ex-girlfriends of mine who are like, you're disgusting, James. But now, now I've got, now I've got a reason to like pay the 30 or 40 bucks or whatever those hotels try to charge you to do laundry. I can you claim it as a business expense. I like it. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Why well, your travel status? The, uh, the other one you mentioned earlier was that, that Augusta rule from Augusta, Georgia is kind of where it got the nickname someone wanted to, to write off. They wanted to rent out their personal residence for the golf tournament that they have there. 
Yeah, it's the, the, the Masters Golf Tournament, which happens in Augusta, Georgia every, every year. Um, so just think of that, the Augusta rule. And I love this. Ron's told, Ron and I have had at least a few conversations about this. So give it to us plain and simple, Ron. And, and if you're listening and you're an entrepreneur or a business owner, I think you're going to like this. This, this is, uh, sometimes it's called a VRBO deduction as well because this vacation rental by, by owner got really big. Home away is another one. Uh, and the idea of having strangers in my home uh, for 14 days a year didn't really, uh, I didn't really like, but I like the idea of renting out my house. And it's also very common that, uh, I mean, I've got a home office, you've got a home office. Uh, that deduction has been around forever and a day. But remember that your social security number is different than your EIN number, your employer identification number, and you treated yourself as differently under the IRS code. There's two separate entities, you personal and your business. So it's common, it, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to have 14 days a year, a little over one a month, to have a business meeting. And you're gonna invite a whole bunch of people into that business meeting. Maybe there's eight, 10, 12, 15 people, and they're not gonna fit in our home office, so we gotta rent the whole house out. And if you rent the whole house out for 14 days a year, uh, it's completely deductible for the business as an expense, as regular and customary, but that income is completely tax exempt and doesn't even have to be declared at 14 days. At 15 days, the IRS says this is a business and it's declarable income. So personally, write yourself, uh, call around to your hotels, get some comparable bids on. Here's how I see, see what it is. You have a business, you have an LLC, okay? You have a personal account where you, you've got your checking amount of money and money that you use to pay rent and food and all those kind of things. For 14 days of the year, you can host a business meeting or business meetings in your home where you invite colleagues or business associates or potential clients and you call it like a mastermind or you call it like an annual retreat or you call it like a monthly mastermind session. Okay. And you do host people in your home. They come to your home, they sit around your living room and you have a conversation about business um, in some capacity. Now, basically what you, uh, while you're doing this previously or afterwards, you would have contacted three close by hotels. That would be in my case in LA, it's the Andas hotel, the Roosevelt and, and the Lowe's hotel in Hollywood. And I've already done this by the way. So I emailed them and I said, Hey, I'm thinking about having 10 people over to my, I'm thinking about having a 10 person board meeting or a business meeting or mastermind. How much would it cost me to use one of your business rooms and for you to cater it with some food and some drinks for like three hours from like 7 PM until 11 PM or all day. They have subsequently then emailed me proposals. And in this, in this case, it ranges from five grand to 15 grand, if you can believe it. But let's just take the average $10,000. Let's just say hypothetically, it's going to cost me $10,000 to rent a room to have a, a meeting or a retreat or something in a, in a nice hotel. Instead, I don't pay the 10 grand to the hotel. Instead, I just have the people come over to my home. We have the board meeting or the meeting or the, the business event in my home. I spend a couple hundred dollars buying some nice food and some drinks or whatever. I have it in my home. I am then able, James Swanick personal, James Swanick the person, I'm now able to send an invoice and charge my business, which let's just say it's James Swanick the business, $10,000 for that day, for that event. Um, for, for hosting the event in my home. My business is then able to pay $10,000 to me personally. That's James Swanick, the person. James Swanick, the person does not have to declare that as income, which means the government cannot tax me on that $10,000 that's just entered my personal account. And guess what? The business has just paid a legitimate business expense which is what you want because you want your business racking up expenses because then you don't have to pay as much, as much tax. So you've had this double win where your business has got a legitimate business expense and you personally have just received $10,000 tax free. 
That means you do not have to pay the government 30%, 40% on that. It's just 10 grand sitting in your pocket. And you can do that 14 times a year or for 14 days per year. Um, now, I, like I said, I've done this. I've meticulously got records from three hotels and I did, this, I did the, the, the average of how much it would cost. And um, uh, I <laughs> once Ron told me this, I actually had an event at my home recently where I had people come over and we sat in my living room and we did a little mastermind. And I'm now going to be, um, you know, I now drop an invoice. I send it from James Swanick Personal to my business, to my LLC. And then I transfer the funds over into my account. And now I've got this tax-free personal money sitting in the bank account that my, the, the government doesn't have to, that I don't have to pay the government any um, percentage on. Did I explain that well enough, Ron? Did I, oh, am, I am I a good student of yours now that you? <laughs> that's dead on. The only thing I would add is really that invoice goes in a filing cabinet and you're only ever really gonna use that invoice or all of those comps and emails from the hotel in the event you ever get audited. Because now you've got some justification of why 10, in your case, is a reasonable and customary number. I mean, $10,000 a day times 14 days is $140,000 tax exempt coming out of your business. And they're going to say, you know, is that reasonable for your area? And you're going to say, here's all my hotels. So it's only in the event of an audit that that paperwork is ever there and used. I love it. It's the Augusta rule. So I'd encourage you if you're listening to Google at first, what's the actual code in the IRS code that the Augusta rule, do you you know? I think it's under 280A. A is an apple. Okay, cool. Now, now, a lot of the the questions I get from people about this Augusta rule, Ron, is, well, does it have to be a home that you own or can it be a place that you rent? Can it be a a place that you're airbnb already? Like, like what are there any limit? What what are the limitations, if any, on, on doing this? Yeah, the code actually doesn't call it a home. We're using home because that's where we live and that's where we're doing it kind of thing. But they they call it a dwelling unit. And it doesn't matter that you own it or you rent it. Uh, So if, uh, I mean, I I know a lot of people nowadays that just don't want to own a home. They want flexibility in their life and they want to live a couple of years here, a couple of years there. And so they just rent. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you own it, if you rent it, uh, they, they, they go into define a dwelling unit can be, uh, uh, your boat, right? It, it can be all kinds of different things. And so, uh, there, there's a way to, so long as it's not a, uh, something that is regularly in used on a daily basis for, uh, like a hotel motel. Mm-hmm type uh, rule, like if you own the hotel, mm-hmm. it doesn't work. But, uh, but other than that, it doesn't matter if you own your house, uh, if you rent your apartment, uh, you can still use this Augusta rule. If I you, love it. If you wanna hold it, uh, I know, you know, Ryan's had a mastermind on a yacht, right? Rented a yacht and that, that clearly would, would have qualified. Yeah. Uh, he's talking about uh, Ron's referring to Ryan Moran, who's a mutual friend of ours. Um, uh, we're talking to Ron Fossum, who is a tax extraordinaire, a t- beating the tax man extraordinaire. He's a serial entrepreneur. Just before we go on with some more tactics, Ron, where can our listener find more about you if they want to engage your services? They can, they can just grab us at uh, ronstaxtips.com. Uh, it's a real short, simple page. We can send them a, how to bust some tax myths. If they've got some questions, how to stop sabotaging your, your small business growth. If they want to engage us, there's a short questionnaire and you can set up an appointment. We can have a conversation about what some of these tax tips might apply to you and which ones do and which ones don't. And that's Ron's Tech Tax Tips, is it? Yeah. Ronstaxtips.com. Okay, I love it. All right, so we're continuing on here. Let's do a few more here, Ron. What else we got besides the, uh, the Augusta rule? besides doing laundry in a hotel, besides um, taking income, um, you know, as a, uh, uh, as a personal loan from your business, what else we got? I, I love this one. If, uh, if, if you've made a mistake in your taxes and now you're hearing some of these and you're like, oh, I could have done that last year. I could have done that. I've been doing that for years and I never knew I could deduct it. The IRS allows everyone to go back and refile their taxes called the 1040 X and you can amend your previous year's taxes. And with that amendment, um, 
they'll not only give you your money back that you overpaid, but they'll give it back to you with interest. <laughs> so check that out. You made the mistake, James. <laughs> you didn't know you qualified for this Augusta deduction, but you can go back in your calendar because I, I know mine is an outlook and I know where I'm at every single day. I'm like, oh, well, last year I did seven days, right? And so you can go back and refile last year's taxes, document the seven days, and take that deduction and they'll send you your, your money back plus interest. So you make the mistake. You say to the tax office, I'm sorry, I made the mistake. And they went, no worries. It's all cool. Here's yeah. your money back. And you know what? We'll throw in a little bit of extra for good measure. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thanks, IRS. Big fan. Love your work. <laughs> <laughs> Only the government, right? Only the government. And that's called a 1040 X where you yeah. amend previous year's tech taxes. Okay, cool. What else we got, Ron? Let's keep going. X as an X-ray. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, so business gifts are frequently something that get maxed out. Uh, so the, a legitimate business gift given directly or indirectly to a specific person is limited to $25 per person per year. So uh, I, I want to give a gift of you know, $50 to, to Ryan who hosted us uh, very graciously. I can only deduct $25 of that gift to, to Ryan. Okay. So instead uh, of, of a gift given directly to a person or indirectly to a person, uh, you can get gift cards. You can get, uh, give, give the gift card to the company, not to the person and make sure you follow the advertising and promotion rules rather than a gift and advertising and promotion, there is no limit on. You can advertise your company as much as you want, right? So okay. you still need to document it properly, like who's getting the gift cards and follow some rules, uh, but give it to a company and, and not to the person directly. So in, that, in this example that you were using in relation to Ryan Moran, what you're saying is instead of giving the gift to Ryan Moran, you'd give it to Ryan Moran's company so you would need to know what his company name is. It might be Ryan Moran LLC, for example, right? Yep. And so, and so you would, does that mean that you have to somehow type in or write in that you're giving it to his company or where can you literally get a gift and hand it to Ryan, the person and say, Oh no, this is for your company, not for you. Like what's, how do we, yep. how do we ship, sort ship it to the office under the company name? Huh? Okay. So if you've got a gift, you send it to the person's company and that means that you can, what, how much can you spend? If, if I want to give something to him, yeah, right. There's gift rules and then there's advertising rules. So if the way I advertise my business is I hand out gift cards, mm -hmm. right. I still need to document who's getting them. And I, so the IRS knows I'm not buying gift cards and giving them to myself. Mm. Right but you don't want to give it a gift the gears gift rules. And then there's advertising rules. If the only way I advertise is handing out gift cards, then there is no limit to it. I see. So that means you're looking at as, at the, as sorry, you're looking at the gift you give as advertising, not as a gift. Yeah. And there's, there's just a few different distinctions in there because the IRS defines it. What's a gift versus advertising, right? And they're like, it's advertising if it does this, this, and this, and this. So one example might be is if I give my, if I give my customers some tickets to the game, if I go to the game, there's one set of rules. If I just give you the tickets, but I don't go to the game, I can treat the cost of the tickets either as a gift or as a advertising or an expense, whichever one is my, to my advantage. Gotcha. But then don't you have to give the tickets to the, that their company rather than to the, the person? Yeah. If we're going to meet at the stadium, I'd just ship it to the company. Right. And now it's considered advertising, which means now you, you can claim more than the $25 of that gift, right? Yeah. How much, how much can you claim? Like how 100%, much, if, if I'm not going to the game, a hundred percent. So you send the ticket, you buy a couple of baseball tickets, you buy some tickets to a game, you send it to the company of the person you want to gift and it costs you $500 for the tickets. Now that is an advertising cost rather than a gift, which means now you're, 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 you're able to deduct $500 versus $25. Yeah. Advertising and promotion. Yep. 
Those are the rules you want to follow. I love it. Yeah. Jeez, that's good. <laughs> the downside is you don't get to go to the game. <laughs> yeah, right. But that works for uh, for like theaters and any kind of performing, any kind of performance, live performance. So, so if in if in doubt, buy tickets from your from your business and send it to whoever it is you want to gift, but send it to their business and and classify it as advertising and promotion. Yeah, and make sure you follow the rules for that that category, advertising and promotion. Yeah. Okay, I love it. Okay, cool. There's another good one. No yeah. more, no more, no more twenty-five dollar gift cards for people. Now I'm going to be giving them two hundred and fifty dollar gift cards, which I'm going to send to their place of business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. What else we got? Uh, boy, we could just keep going. Uh, let's squeeze out. Let's squeeze out three, three more, and then uh, a friend of mine, uh, Darren, who lives in my apartment building here, um, overheard me. Uh, talking to you like he was walking down and he heard me talking tax strategy and he subsequently sent me a text message with four questions that he wants me to ask you Ron <laughs> so there you go you're, you're a very popular man people like even someone who just heard me talking taxes like oh are you doing a tax webinar can you ask this um yeah. all right so let's do three more of yours and then I'll, I'll pepper you with these questions at the end well let's do uh what would be the most impactful let's do uh well, right off your kids. If you've got kids, uh, it, you use them in the business. And there's all kinds of ways to document it properly. It's got to be age-appropriate activities for the children. But, I mean, one of my business partners brought his son in. And we had him, like, you know, when Costco showed up with all the water, then he was unpacking the water and putting it in the fridge. And he was unpacking the Costco reams of paper and putting that in the cupboard. Pretty simple activities. But you can take... And it's similar to the Augusta rule. You can take $6,300, $6,350, I believe, in 2017, $6,350 as a deduction in the business. You don't have to pay Social Security and Medicare and all that because he's a minor child and he's yours. Uh, it's deductible as the business. You pay it to him, take him to the bank, open his own bank account, start teaching him about money and how he's earned money has to be a, a legitimate wage, you know, you can't pay him $50 an hour because that's not reasonable for a kid unstocking paper. But that, that money is completely tax exempt. He doesn't even have to file a tax return. So if you've got three kids, there's $18,000 that can come out of your business and go into three separate accounts for them if they're all doing legitimate work inside your business and you've documented it properly. And so the benefit to you doing that for your kids is what? And the benefit to the kids is what? Well, I, I think the biggest benefit, quite frankly, is the psychology of it. You start teaching your kid about the value of a dollar and how money is really created and, and adding value to someone else before you get paid. And then, you know, teaching them when, when and how to spend it because now it's their dollars. Mm. Trust me, it, the, the kid catches on very quickly when they're spending their dollars versus mom and dad buy me this toy. Let's pay for the pizza party or whatever. I think that's the biggest benefit, but the, the tax benefit, which is, I think what you're asking mm -hmm. is, uh, it's completely tax exempt income into your household. You've shifted it from you being in a 35, 40, 50% tax bracket between state and federal down to that $6,000 comes out, it's deductible for the business and the kid doesn't have to file an income on it. Right, so it's basically a tax, it's a tax deduction for you, for your business and your child gets it tax-free. Tax-free income into your household. Terrific, and you're basically hiring your kids, right? You're using your kids in the business, so. Yes. Um, and, and then it, let's, the age appropriate activities for the children, like what, what, how old uh, is a kid? Con, is, a, is a cod? Geez, sorry, this is a bit of a tongue twister here. At what age do they cease to be a kid or a child in the, in the, in the government's eyes? Uh, I, I don't think there is a, I, I've never seen a number as far as how young they can be before they can do it. Uh, and I've never seen a, a number that, that they're done uh, until they're, I mean, at some point they're going to break through that $6,000 income year and they're going to have to start filing. Mm. Does that make sense? So let's just say that they're from birth up until they're like, just, just as an example, 15 years old, you know, 15, you can pay them. Is it six? Is it annually? Is it 63 50? Um, 
from the business or that that's the amount of money that's tax free. So you can pay them 20 grand if you want, but the first 63, 6,350, they don't have to pay tax on and you can claim it as a tax, as a business deduction. Yeah. And it's, it's not bad. If you go over the 63, you just got to file and now you've shifted income from your 40% bracket over Mm. to their, you know, 15% bracket. It's still a good deal. You know, if they've earned $10,000 that year. Yeah. It's it's still a good deal. Yeah. You shifted income. I'm telling you, Ron, you've, you've inspired me to want to go out and procreate and produce some kids now. <laughs> it's been tough to, it's been tough to get me to, 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 to like, you know, get married and have kids, but now you're, you're saving me money on the kids. I'm like, any ladies out there that want to like, uh, you know, pop out a couple of kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, do it, you do it for 10 years That's 60 grand that the kid could be, they could pay for their own, start paying for their own college or do something mm. responsible with them. But uh, that's a truckload of money. 60 grand per kid tax exempt. I love it. All right, let's go. We've got two more and then I'll get these questions. This is great. We're talking to Ron Fossum, international tax expert on how to beat the tax man. You can check out more of him at ronstaxtips.com. What's another one, Ron? Uh, I, I like, I, I said I, I, I got my start in real estate uh, for my investing. Once I started getting out of the stock market type stuff um, and looking for other alternatives, I got heavy into real estate. So if you restore a historical building in certain uh, territories uh, and yeah, like the go zone, for example, if you built after a hurricane Katrina, uh, there's some, there's some other areas that are very specific areas. If it meets a historical criteria, then and you restore the building to its original stature, then frequently the IRS will give you a tax exempt status for that building. And so the rents that, 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 building then generates are tax free. So you got to buy a dilapidated building that meets a historical standard. Everyone agrees that it's, you know, it's a good deal uh, and negotiate in advance. Then they, they literally give you a tax exempt certificate that says the rent that this generates is tax free. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. So you can, so you have to buy a historic building. You'd have to buy this, right? As long as it's, it's, it's considered an, a historical building. And then in most cases, not all, but you have to check, you get a tax exempt status for it, which means all the tax that you receive from any of the tenants that live in there in forever, I'm assuming, is tax free? Yeah. So, so long as the building continues to meet the standard, they'll usually give you a certificate for like five years or 10 years, and then they're going to look at the building and make sure it still meets mm. historical standards. Mm. Uh, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. The more, the more I'm hearing you go through these strategies, the more I'm actually on the side of president Donald Trump, where, where he comes to like (laughs) not wanting to show his, his um, tax returns because he's being ordered. Now time may tell, maybe he has to produce them, but I, I I tend to, the, the more I get into these conversations about tax, the more I tend to lean towards the idea that he actually doesn't have anything to hide. It's just, he's literally just playing by these IRS rules. And he always like in the two, in the 2016 debate between Trump and, and Hillary Clinton, it's all the Democrats were always like, show us your tax returns. What are you hiding? Show us your tax returns, the bombshells that are hiding in there. Maybe there's no bombshells in there at all. Maybe it's just a very clever use of the IRS code. And maybe it's not even a clever use. Maybe it's just you consider it if you do your reading and you do your research and you read it thoroughly enough, you understand the rules, you play by the rules and you can end up paying no tax or, or very little tax. Am, am, am I articulating that well without earning the, uh, the, ra- the wrath of all the anti-Trump uh, <laughs> listeners out there who are, will start abusing me and sending me messages saying, I can't believe you're defending Trump. I'm yeah. like, well, I'm not defending Trump. I'm just, I'm defending the idea that you can, use the IRS code to your advantage legally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and let's use someone a little bit more neutral. You're dead on by the way, but uh, you know, Robert Kiyosaki wrote about this in rich dad, poor dad uh, and sold 60 million books. The tax code is written for self-employed people and the highest tax that you'll ever pay is as a W2 employee. So it's not new news and it's been around for a long, long time. He just, has implemented it probably on a massive scale. I haven't seen his returns, but uh, I would strongly suggest that he's, he's just implemented it all. 
And so the people that haven't implemented it are probably the ones that are upset the most. So you sold, he sold millions of books, Robert Kiyosaki, but are you, are you saying that, that, that he's managed to keep most, if not all of that money because of the way that he's structured the, the deal around that? What, what do you think or know that he's done? Yeah, Robert's, Robert loved real estate, right? And so he used a lot of 1031 exchanges where you bought a house and sold a house, but you exchanged it in, uh, it's called a like-kind exchange under the tax code. You can do it for life insurance, you can do it for annuities, you can do it for real estate, all kinds of stuff. You swap one investment for another investment and it's the same. And then you don't have to pay tax on that transaction and you can defer it, defer it, defer it. You can essentially defer it nearly forever. Uh, by following a certain set of guidelines. And he just kept all of his money. You can keep buying, so he played Monopoly, right? He started with one rental, got several rentals, sold them, bought a, ho- bought a bigger, you know, fourplex, and then bought hotels, uh, and just got in. I mean, he, he played that game all the way up till he started buying gold mines. Hmm. Because it's all real estate. So there you go. If you're into real estate, check out 1031 exchanges and then also talk about uh, consider restoring historical buildings. Let's do one last one and then I'll rattle through these questions here. Oh, let's, let's do a good one. Uh, As opposed to what the ones you've given us so far, which are crap. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do this one. Uh, I'm going to read this one right out of the code as well. And this mm-hmm. is... If your presence is required or not required and your tra- whether it was something is a vacation or it's a business trip. Mm-hmm. Right? So uh, if your presence is required, count it as a business day or any day your presence uh, at a particular place for a specific business purpose. Count that as a business day. And this is directly on the code. Count it as a business day even if you spend most of the day on non-business activities. I love it. So let's use an example. What's an example of that? So uh, wouldn't it be fair to say uh, that you and I were both guests at someone else's event? That's a key point. If it's our own event, we have control over the schedule and it's not going to fit this rule. We'd have to use some other rules. But you and I were at an event uh, hosted uh, by someone else and he dictated the schedule, right? So when, when you were on stage and when I was going to be on stage, the days that we had to be there, he all asked for that and we followed his schedule. It's his event. Mm-hmm. So we showed up for that and he said, Ron, you're going to speak on uh, Friday at two o'clock mm-hmm. and expect to speak for 45 minutes or an hour. And I mm-hmm. was like, great. So that morning, uh, I run down the street and I go to Disneyland. <laughs> yeah. That's not a business activity. I'm not conducting any kind of business in Disneyland. I come back and I speak at two o'clock that afternoon. It's it, the whole day is a business day. Mm. And how, to, how do you deduct it a business day? Does that mean like all the money that you spent during that yeah. day is considered a business expense, even at Disneyland? Yeah. Or is it like a daily rate that you can deduct? What is it? Yeah. If your principal business activity during work hours is in the pursuit of the trade of your business, count that day as a business day as deductible. Also as a business day in any day, you're prevented from working because of circumstances beyond your control. This one came up, I was at uh, an event. Uh, this guy's had me back like four different times and he just constantly changes it. So I got to fly in Thursday night. I got to be there for the event, you know, Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday is going to be my travel day back home. And inevitably he changes it. Like it's beyond my control. He says, well, someone else didn't show up. Ron, we want you to speak uh, Saturday. So take Friday off. Well, I'm already there. It's mm. beyond my control. But now everything that I do Friday is a business day and deductible. Mm. I'm captive to the host changing the schedule. Or right. flight got canceled, that kind right. of stuff. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It, it, it's- so what can you claim as a tax deduction? Is it like the cost of you going to this event or is it whatever you spend during that day? Like what's the, what's the, the tax deduction you can yeah, make almost, here? Almost all your travel is absolutely going to be deductible. Your meals are going to fall under the meals rules. Uh, but you, you, fall, you, you want to look into your travel status. Everything that's deductible in travel status uh, is, a, is a business day. And everything in that business day is fully deductible. So I love Disneyland, it. My entrance into Disneyland, which was, what was it? They're charging a hundred bucks or something to get in nowadays. Mm-hmm. Fully deductible. Yeah. So now I can go to Disneyland, buy some 
candy floss. What do they call it? We call it fairy floss. What cotton candy? That's it. The Americans, you Americans, love to call it cotton candy. I'm eating cotton candy. I'm eating crap food. I'm spending a hundred bucks to get in, and then I decide I want to go for a three course meal at the all you can eat buffet at Disneyland. I'm eating that, and then I race back and I do my talk. I can claim all of that Disneyland expenditure. You can, you can claim it all, but uh, the entrance would be fully deductible. The food would be under the, the food rules, which are usually 50%. There you go. I love it. This is all good stuff, Ron. Um, my let question me, is... Let me piggyback that one real, real quick. Yep. Counting certain weekends and holidays. And again, it's straight out of the code. Count your weekends, holidays, and other uh, necessary standby days as business days if they fall between any two business required business days. If they fall, if they follow your business meetings or activity and you remain at the business destination for non-business or personal reasons, don't count them as business days. So you and I were speaking at uh, this event and it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. Mm -hmm. And you and I decided for non-business reasons, we're going to hang out Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and then go home. Right? Yep. There's no required business on Monday and Tuesday mm -hmm. uh, that then those aren't deductible. If we get done Sunday and there's a required business reason that we're there Wednesday, so now we book ended this Monday and Tuesday still count as business days because I'm required to be there till Wednesday. Gotcha. Makes now, sense. I'm taking two random days bookend it with business on either side, they become business days. If I don't bookend it and I'm just staying an extra couple days, it's not a business day. It's not deductible. So my question is, thank you for sharing that one. My question is in terms of keeping records, right? Is if in doubt, should I, should I just make all these expenditures on my business credit card, for example, as a business expense or, should I be doing it on personal credit cards and business? Should I be keeping physical receipts? Should I, is it enough just to have the, the electronic receipt, which comes up on your credit card statement? Like how do we kind of like organize and understand these things? Because here's the thing I might go traveling and, and I've listened to you give me this advice. And in my head, I'm like, now, hang on a second. Ron said that I can do this thing where I'm speaking and I'm counting the weekends and the holidays. Maybe I'll put this on my, credit card should i make a note to remind myself that if i get audited i'll need to prove that also i just like ah whatever it's fine just put it all on the business uh, credit card as a business expense and we'll be fine so what's your advice around that yeah there's there's a couple things uh it, it's so easy to track stuff now so there's a if you're into using the vehicle stuff right there's an app you can put on your phone that tracks all your mileage and you literally swipe right if it's a business deduction and puts it in a category swipe left if it's a if it's personal and still puts it in the category like it's charity but it's personal it's still deductible mm. and it tracks all of that so it's super simple stuff there's also apps that uh, allow you to take the receipt that you just take a picture of the receipt and it uploads it into your books and then you can categorize it that way so you don't have to have the physical receipts uh, digital copy is fine and then sometimes you don't even have to have receipts so like meals the IRS has said meals up to $75. You don't have to have the physical receipt. You still need to track if it's a business lunch, you know, the who, what, when, where, and how, you know, where did you go? Who did you talk to? What did you talk about? Why is it a business meeting? What was your intent to make a profit? And just document that in your notes. I tend to keep everything in my calendar and, uh, yeah, I back up my outlook left and right, but that's, so, that's where I tend to keep it all. So am I being ineffective or, 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 or foolhardy, if you like, where I will go on a trip, travel, for example, and I know it's work-related. I'm doing it on my Instagram. I'm doing it on my, snaps, my Snapchat. I'm sharing it. I'm doing, it's all related to business, and I'm just putting it all on my company credit card and just trusting that you know when it comes up, it'll show, oh, look, I was in Vilnius, Lithuania on this date. I was definitely speaking at Matt Posies' event. Oh, look, this is in Austin. I knew I was speaking at Ryan Moran's event. That's business. Oh, look, I made a transaction here in Bristol in the UK. I was filming my personal life with my brother and niece and nephew on my Insta stories to show a lifestyle business like and, and just keep putting it on there. Is that foolhardy to just be making those transactions on the cart and not making some other or not collecting physical receipts or not 
you know, typing something down to justify in the moment that it's a business expense? Yeah, the, the IRS says something about it uh, being recorded concurrently, uh, which then it later defined concurrently, according to Webster, is at the same time. But according to the IRS definition, it's sometime within a week you've documented something. Uh, so what's on your credit card statement is most of the information. Uh, but they're certainly not going to tell you who's, who's there, right? So you and I have lunch. Uh, where we are and how much the lunch is is obviously there. But my name isn't on your statement. And what we talked about isn't on your statement. And the IRS knows none of us have, you know, photographic memories. So I would go one step further and start making notes on your statements uh, of the missing information that you're going to need. So, so does that mean I've got to wait for a physical copy of the statement and then write a thing? Like I'm not going to trust me. I'm not going to do that. Right. So, yeah. so what's the, what's the, what is the best yeah. thing in the moment that I can do to cover my ass, so to speak? Yeah. So, so download an app that takes, you got the receipt. You're in the restaurant. Like this is going to be done before you leave the restaurant. You're going to take a picture of your receipt it's going to upload it and you're going to put your notes right there. And you, you literally just hit your speaker and say, this was lunch with Ron and we spoke about some tax tips and maybe I'm going to hire him for, you know, X, Y, Z. And now it's all uploaded. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be, if in the event of, now you've got it documented and you've got your credit card receipt that's going to show up or your credit card statement that's going to show mm -hmm. up 30 days later. And now you've got those two in the event that are going to be filed in the event of an audit. Now you've got it. Mm. Is there an app that you suggest? Uh, I like mileage IQ uh, for the travel or for the, the vehicles. I, I don't own it. And it's mm -hmm. just good. It's super, super simple if you're trying to track vehicle stuff. Uh, and then most, I mean, almost everybody, all the, all the books company, whether it's, you know, Penny or QuickBooks or whatever, they all have uh, a feature to upload receipts. So just, just use whichever people are all over the board, or what, what they use for books, but. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. I like it. Um, a couple but of questions. I would, I would upload it in a minute is, I mean, the time, if, if you're going to try to, Oh, I'll do it at the end of the week and catch it up or I'll yeah, do you it. don't do it. You don't do it. Life gets in the way. You just yeah. don't do it. You're yeah. too busy moving on to the next thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So a couple of questions here from Darren in my apartment building. Uh, who overheard our conversation. <laughs> How do you organize your records for your accountant? Uh, well, we, we give them read only access to the bank account so they can just go in and look. Uh, we train them when you first take on a, an accountant, we train them exactly what it is. A lot of the stuff that we do is pretty habitual, right? So this is always going to be deductible because of this, this, and this. And so they always get it categorized, right? Uh, but they never have access to the money. I've, I've heard, you know, horror stories that accountants mm. ran out for the money because they had access to the cash. Just give them read only access. Uh, yeah, I they, do that. I have an accountant and I, 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 they have my username and passwords and I, I don't just give them read only. I give them f full capacity to make transactions for me. Like I don't, I don't like getting slowed down by like, I have nine people who work for me now across the globe and they, they always used to send me invoices and then I would physically go into my bank account and I would transfer the money and pay them. Now I've got a system down where I say, don't send me the invoice, send the invoice straight to my accountant and my accountant has my username and password and my accountant pays them. So I never see an invoice. Um, yeah. uh, the accountant sees it and they have full right to, to go in. At some point you just got to like trust your accountant. It's not like, unless you're kind of like, Sylvester Stallone's character in the movie Rocky five, where uh, the, the movie starts with him, you know, his accountant basically robbed him of his millions of all the money that he made. And now he has to move back to the suburbs of Philadelphia. That's an, that's probably not going to happen in the most case that might happen 0.0001% of the time. But for the most part, I think you've got to trust your, your accountant to do those things. Yeah. Either that or give them, set them up a separate username and password and put, uh, transaction limits on them. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. Yeah. Right. So it's you can go from one to the spectrum. Where they they can only read it. They can have their own username with limits, or you can do full access. It, it you know a lot of mm. it is is what's gonna mm. what's gonna serve you best, so that you actually use it and implement it. Some of the other questions here from Darren, you, you may have just answered actually. Um, he says, do you forward things to your bookkeeper? Do you file things yourself? Do you log receipt purposes like mileage, et cetera? I think we kind of, we covered those, didn't we? Anything yeah. else? Any other notes on that or, or did we cover that? 
Yeah, it's a lot of times when you're when you're well. Here, here's the deal: uh, you're going to have to outgrow if your business is successful. You're going to outgrow your professionals. You're probably going to outgrow your attorney. You're probably going to outgrow your bookkeeper. You're probably going to outgrow your CPA, tax planner. Um, if you're trying to get to be a professional football player and you're still being coached by your high school coach, odds are you're never going to make it, right? So uh, know that that there's points when it's time to let go of this bookkeeper, or let go of this accountant, and get the next one up, right? Uh, so that that's part of it, and then there's some value in, it's usually right around three years, I have every single one of my professionals audited by someone new, so that, because I know I can go back and refile for three years. So even if they're missing something, I can, I can have someone new come in with the new strategies, and if they can still find stuff, I can go back and still get it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's a, that's a nice segue into the final question that Darren asks, which is, Walk us through your daily actions to keep your accounts and finances in order and what you're looking for and ways of minimizing tax. So yeah, walk us through your daily actions, Ron. Yeah, so I, I leverage an assistant quite heavily. Uh, so everything goes to, to her and she has a separate little scanner on her desk. So she scans all the receipts, she does it all. Uh, in the moment, I don't even take the picture and upload it. Um, and then she holds me accountable. So. And then from my assistant, it goes to the bookkeeper and the bookkeeper does the monthly stuff. And then the end of the year, the accountant does that stuff. And then I, I still have tax planners look at my stuff. Uh, so I, I tax plan for other people, but I don't know it all. Yeah. If there's a new deduction out, I want to know about it. If something applies to something I'm doing, by the way, here's a really good one. Do something in the real estate space because it's impossible to go anywhere and not be on or looking at real estate. <laughs> no matter it. where you're going, you're in the real estate business, right? Not not all of us have this. You know, I've got a podcast and I've got all these interviews, like the, the lifestyle that you've got, the business that you've got set up around it. So say say you're in real estate and follow those real estate rules, but it's impossible to go anywhere and not be in the real estate business. I love it. That's a great rule. I'm a big fan. Well, Ron, we're going to wrap this up. We could go on for another three hours and I would love to, but at some point we got to, we got to, we got to cut it. Right. But um, uh, just a reminder, if you're listening or watching, just go to Ron's tax tips.com and you can find out some more things. You can connect with uh, Ron Fossum there. Um, but some amazing, amazing tips here. We've got uh, take your hobbies and turn it into a business. Um, don't re defer tax until retirement. Um, have a tax exempt retirement structure instead of taking income taxed as ordinary income, take a shareholder loan, um, doing laundry on your, in your travels is tax deductible, which is pretty awesome. The Augusta rule, which is my favorite, which is up to 14 days of the year, you can host um, people in your home and, and claim that as a tax deduction on your business while also paying your personal account tax free uh, income. Um, the IRS allows you to do a 1040 X, which amends the previous year's taxes. Plus they'll give you some interest back on it as well. So you make the mistake and the, the IRS says, ah, oh, no, no worries. It's okay. But we'll give you some more money as well. I'm like, sweet, cool. Um, business gifts versus advertising and promotion. If you want to send someone a gift classified as advertising and promotion, that way you get um, a much bigger tax uh, deduction than if you're just giving it to the person. Um, if you're giving it to the person, you only can deduct $25 per person. If you've got kids, write off your kids. Use your kids in the business. You can take a $6,350 deduction in the business um, and, the, and, the, and your kids get that uh, tax-free. Um, real estate. If you restore historical buildings, sometimes you can, you can have the building be tax exempt. Wherever you go, you consider yourself in the real estate business, which means you can deduct travel expenses or things that you're doing in that place so long as you're looking at real estate to buy. Uh, 1031 exchanges, um, when you're speaking at someone else's event and your presence is required, or even if you're not speaking at someone's event, if your presence is merely required, um, then look at the, then that could be a business day and look at, you know, counting weekends and holidays uh, as well in terms of being a necessary part um, of your business that you can um, deduct. Um, be sure to record concurrently, which means uh, 
instead of just putting things on a credit card, take a photo of a receipt, upload it to a book, to an app like QuickBook or Mileage IQ or any of those things. And then also the my last point I would say is invest in an advisor like Ron, um, get a tax attorney, get someone other than just your accountant who in most cases will not know all the nitty gritty of, uh, of the stuff that Ron Fossum has shared with us today. Was that an okay summary, Ron? Wow, I, I couldn't have been more succinct in, in that summary. I talk about a near photographic memory. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just that good, Ron. I've been doing this a while. <laughs> Ron Fossum is his name. Uh, check out ronstaxtips.com. Ron, thank you so much. This has been so valuable to me personally and to my listeners. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share your, your wealth of knowledge with us, sir. Oh, happy to, happy to be here. Thank you. I'm honored.